I mean, what you're writing is nice and all, but is it even the right thing? Hello, it's good to see you again. I hope you've had a nice period of time since the last time we met, however long it happens to have been. I know I've shared this story before, but it always comes to mind when I'm in the midst of a paper grading binge. Years ago, I was taking a writing class, one of the first I took in college, and I had some assignment to do something. I don't remember exactly what. So with all the overconfidence of a young writer who had some teacherly praise under his belt, I did what I knew would put me in my new teacher's good graces. I polished off my fanciest words, strung them up in my fanciest sentences, and turned it in to await the applause that was sure to come. And when I got that paper back, it came back with a big old C tattooed on the first page. Of course, I was dumbfounded, but my teacher pulled me aside after class and explained what had happened. He acknowledged that I had good writing skills, but then he told me that while I hadn't produced bad writing, I also had produced the wrong kind of writing. See, the assignment had asked me to do something specific, something that I hadn't done. My teacher told me that the bad grade on that paper wasn't enough to affect my final grade, and then explained that what he really wanted to do was push me to make sure that my writing showed up first and foremost to do the job it was supposed to do, and then to be stylistically impressive. That is, he didn't want people to accuse me in the future of what he called linguistic prestidigitation, using a flashy style to hide the fact that I kinda had nothing to say. Since then, I've had similar experiences from the other side, as I've pulled students back from relying on style at the expense of doing the job they're meant to do. But I've also had the more common experience of student writers turning in papers that flat out just don't do the things that I've asked for. And that's probably one of the bigger bummers I experience as a teacher. You put all that time into writing a prompt and teaching the stuff for a few weeks, and then the paper just misses the point. It's like disqualifying someone from a contest on a technicality. It's just not a very satisfying way to end things. So today, I want to talk about how you can make sure that you're writing the right thing. First in a school setting, but then just in general. I don't know if I can overstate the importance of actually following the writing prompt when you're writing for school. When prompts are designed properly, they're designed to measure your ability to accomplish certain things in your writing. Usually, they'll ask you to accomplish a primary rhetorical task and then to perform a handful of supporting tasks in order to accomplish that primary purpose successfully. So, for example, I might write a prompt that asks students to write a persuasive argument that proposes a solution to a particular problem. That's the single most important job that that paper has to do. If we may return to my favorite toaster, this is like asking someone to design a machine that toasts bread. If it doesn't do that, it's a failed toaster. Then, in order to make that argument successful, the prompt will ask students to showcase their ability to make supporting claims, provide reliable evidence, and link those claims and evidence with sound reasoning. It's impossible to do the main job well without doing these smaller jobs, and doing these smaller jobs well will increase the likelihood that you're doing the main job well. Or I might assign a paper that asks students to perform a rhetorical analysis. It's a job that involves identifying specific details, describing their rhetorical significance, and then explaining the connection between the details and their significance. It's the what, so what, and how do you know steps that we've talked about before. But then I'll occasionally get papers like these. Someone might write a paper where they say that their goal is to persuade adolescent Americans to spend less time with social media, and then they'll write a paper that goes over 10 things people could do to spend less time on their screens. But do you see the problem? A paper that simply announces 10 steps to a healthier relationship with technology is a paper that does the job of informing the audience, not persuading them. Giving people information is not the same thing as motivating them to take action. Could that information be motivating? Well, sure, but by itself, it isn't persuasion. See, imagine you have a reader who knows they should change the way they do things. They've probably already heard the same things their whole lives. Set limits, spend time with real people, go outside and play. The problem is not that they don't know what to do, it's that they don't do it. There are obstacles besides the lack of knowledge getting in the way. So a truly persuasive paper will not just repeat the same 10 things everyone always says. Instead, it will zero in on an actual problem, an actual hurdle, and then work readers through a meaningful solution in order to ensure that they take action. When you inform someone, you give them knowledge that they didn't have before. 
When you persuade someone, you get them to do something they weren't doing before. And when an assignment asks for persuasion, writing an informative paper is like building a toaster that's really good at watering houseplants. Similarly, it's common for students to turn in a draft of a rhetorical analysis that rehearses a movie trailer in impressively minute detail, recounting every word and frame from beginning to end. But that's not an analysis because it doesn't explain the rhetorical significance of those details. It's just a detailed summary, and of course a summary is not an analysis. So there's a big difference between turning in a rhetorical analysis that talks about ethos in a clumsy way and turning in a summary that doesn't address ethos at all. One is the right kind of paper that has room for improvement, and the other is just the wrong thing. It's like responding to a chemistry test with an answer key for your history exam. Those aren't bad answers, but they're the wrong answers for a chemistry test. In fact, come to think of it, I'm pretty sure that the assignment I flubbed asked me to analyze an argument I had been in with someone, and I just ended up summarizing an argument. Flat out, I did the wrong thing. So if you're writing for school, and if you do nothing else, make absolutely sure that you understand what a given assignment is asking for you to do. Is it asking you to analyze a text, compare and contrast two ideas, reflect on your own learning, tell a story? If you don't know for sure, ask. Most of the professors I know sit around in their offices all day wondering why their students never stop by to ask for help. And that wondering only intensifies once we start grading papers. These kinds of problems are so much easier and more fun to fix before grades are on the line. Because again, writing assignments are meant to assess your ability to do something. In the same way that a math test tests your ability to calculate the volumes of solids, a rhetorical analysis paper tests your ability to explain how rhetorical discourse works. And the test just doesn't work if you turn in a summary instead of an analysis. And sure, all of this might sound like a contrived system of right and wrong that only applies in schools. School writing will always be a little artificial, but by the same token, spending time in the weight room isn't the same as playing football. You train techniques and capacities in artificial settings so that they're ready to go in authentic ones. So it's true then that real life doesn't come with prompts, but that doesn't mean there isn't still a risk of writing the wrong thing. In fact, if anything, the stakes of writing the wrong thing get even higher once you're done with school. In school, you get specific prompts in order to elicit writing that demonstrates specific skills. In life, there are no prompts, but there are different situations that require you to demonstrate different skills. And of course, these situations, when it comes to writing, are known as rhetorical situations. In school, your writing fails or succeeds based on how well it responds to the prompt. In life, your writing fails or succeeds based on how well it responds to the rhetorical situation. When it comes to rhetorical situations, though, there's nowhere better to turn than to our old friend, the rhetorical situation investigator. So to show you what I'm talking about, let's turn it over to him. I thought we decided we weren't doing this camera thing anymore, but uh, it's fine. Just, just go ahead. So the rhetorical situation, huh? I mean, that's the sort of thing you learn in the academy. At least it was when I first joined the grammar police, before they took my badge and red pen and I started working as a private RSI. But I guess that's not really what you wanted to know now, was it? To put it simply, the rhetorical situation is your context, a network of relationships between you, your audience, different situational constraints, and most importantly, your exigence. Now the exigence is the whole reason for everything. It's the spark that sets off all that situational dry powder. When you write something, it's in response to an exigence. And whatever you write is meant to modify or resolve that exigence in a meaningful way. So successful writing is a fitting response to any given exigence. Actually, it's like the time the break room in the precinct caught fire. Obviously, the fire was an exigence, a disruption to the night that called for a prompt response. Now, this was back when Richards was a rookie, and he was a real by-the-books type of guy. His gut reaction was to start writing a memo to everyone about proper microwave safety. But there's not a memo in the world that's going to snuff out a fire, you know that. Maybe we needed that memo but it wasn't the right response for the exigence at the time. Luckily though, Sergeant Weaver was there back then. Richards had barely started typing up that memo by the time the firefighters showed up. Of course, they never let us live down the fact that we'd almost lost the building because someone added a zero to the timer when they were cooking a burrito, 
But I guess that's also beside the point, isn't it? Well, actually, I had a client a while ago who was in a difficult rhetorical situation. It was a student at the city college. They'd auditioned to be in a performing group for their major and just barely didn't make the cut. The problem, though, was that they needed a spot in that group to graduate, and they were the first runner-up to a bunch of people who were just in the group for fun. So they came to me with a draft of an email they were going to send to their professor. It was a draft full of what you might call righteous indignation. It was real peppery stuff. The professor was dishonest, the auditions were a sham, the program was mismanaged and unreasonable. It was clear that this client was all wound up, and that the result of this audition was not just a personal slight, but also a final straw on the camel's back. And all that frustration poured out in just a few paragraphs like a summer storm. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with getting your feelings out. Venting your frustrations can be a worthwhile thing to do. But it's not the right thing to do if your exigence requires you to persuade a professor to let you into a performing group when they were the one who didn't let you in in the first place. So if not making it into the group is the exigence and getting into the group is the desired resolution, just complaining about the injustice of it all, it's not a fitting response. The response, the thing you end up writing, has got to be something that actually convinces the person in charge to make a change. So I talked my client back from the brink. Instead of just writing an email that unloaded those negative feelings, we reframed it all as a plea for help. Instead of talking about how bad the professor was and how corrupt the program was, we presented the argument that the program has specific requirements, that being a part of the group was a requirement for graduation, and that people who need to be in the group shouldn't lose spots to people who just want to be in the group. And wouldn't you know it, but my client was in the group that very next day. The second email wasn't just a better written email, it was an email that did the right job. It responded to the exigence in the right way. So that's the trick. If you don't have a prompt, your job is to understand your situation, find your exigence, and then figure out what kind of a response is a fitting response to that exigence. Writing a memo is a fine activity, but it's the wrong response for an act of fire. Venting your frustrations, also fine, but it's the wrong response when you need help from the person you're frustrated with. If you don't respond to the exigence properly, it's not going to matter how good your writing skills are. Failing to address the exigence is going to break whatever it is you're writing. Really though, I've got anywhere else to be but here, so what do you say we just call it a day? Well, he's pleasant as always, but the point is a good one. Really, a writing prompt in school is an artificial exigence, an event that requires a particular kind of response. In life, the parameters of a rhetorical exigence and the appropriate response often aren't made as explicitly, but they're still there and your writing will miss the mark if it isn't a fitting response to the exigence. So, like the example of the email for help reconsidering an audition result, that's a situation that calls for a collaborative approach, not a cathartic rant. In those cases where the rhetorical situation is clear and the job you have to do is more obvious, it can be easier to figure out how to address the exigence effectively. As long as your response leads to a good result in an effective way, you're on track. But that can get trickier when the rhetorical situation isn't as self-evident, especially with literary writing. The world will probably get along just fine without your poem or novel, so what's the driving force that justifies the work? How do you know if your creative work is a fitting response to its exigence? In a case like that, it can be helpful to go back to thinking about what your readers might be expecting. Remember, the audience is as much a part of the rhetorical situation as the exigence is, so your audience's expectations can help you to frame a fitting response to your shared exigence. And this is where I think back to a comment one of my former poetry teachers made about the difference between literary poetry and what he called pulpit poetry. You might know what I'm talking about. It's the kind of very earnest poetry that has a very specific religious message to convey, and that does so in an almost nursery rhymey formal package, complete with exaggerated rhymes and rhythms. The trouble, he was saying, is that many inexperienced poets who want to write about their religious or spiritual experiences often fall into the trap of writing pulpit poetry rather than literary religious poetry. And the difference between the two is one of exigence, especially as it's reflected in reader expectations. A poem that's heavy-handed in outlining theological principles or instilling the values of a religious community may have a place at the pulpit during a sermon, where the audience expects and seeks a didactic response to the exigence of their desire both to express faith and to have their faith affirmed. 
In those kinds of situations, two pairs of footprints in the sand becoming one may be just the right rhetorical response for the situation. But the kinds of readers who come to literature come with very different expectations. They don't want to be preached to. They're not looking for orthodoxy or instruction or anything like that. Instead, they come to a poem expecting to share in a human experience. In response to that exigence, a single set of footprints in the sand may be received more as trite moralizing nonsense than as an uplifting component of a meaningful sermon. The exigences of literary situations, then, call for something more like the complex grappling with faith that shows up in something like the work of Gerard Manley Hopkins, which, though it ranks among the most technically and artistically impressive poetry in the language, often doesn't play as well in a Sunday school. And of course, it's not just overly earnest treatments of faith that can put off literary readers. Similar treatments of political, social, and personal beliefs can fall flat for literary readers, too. And just as there's good religious poetry, there can be good political poetry or fiction with political themes, but it's important to recognize that the kind of political discourse that works at a rally probably won't constitute a fitting response to the exigences associated with reading fiction. When the exigence calls for storytelling, readers will often grow suspicious when they sense that the story is playing second fiddle to the political argument, even when it's an argument they're inclined to agree with. Again, it's not a matter of writing well or poorly, or of finding out whether readers agree or disagree with you. It's about finding the exigence, the imperfection marked by urgency, and then creating a fitting response. And this is really a theoretical discussion for another day, but genres are essentially stabilized ways of responding to common rhetorical situations. The exigences of job searches are fairly stable, so the generic features of resumes are too. The rhetorical pressures on young adult fantasy novels, primetime sitcoms, office memos, and college application essays are also fairly consistent, so each of those genres have in turn developed consistent features. Which is really just to say that if you're ever in doubt about how you're addressing an exigence, or whether you're even addressing the right exigence, you can find some guidance in the work of writers who have done it before. So what kind of response do the exigences of contemporary poetry call for? Well, spend some time with the work of a range of contemporary poets and see what they're doing. In the same way that looking at someone else's resume can help you to write your own by showing you the rhetorical expectations that readers of resumes bring to that rhetorical situation, looking at an established poet's work can show you how poets develop fitting responses to their own literary exigences. And I'll emphasize that the goal here is not just to copy their style, to add tricks to your linguistic prestidigitation repertoire, but instead to understand what they're doing with their writing, the rhetorical purpose behind it all. And that's so that you can ensure that your writing is doing its job too, rather than just wearing the right uniform. As we finish our discussions today, I want to take a moment just to say thank you. To all of you for watching, to all of you who have subscribed, and to those who have joined the channel as members. However you've chosen to support the show, I just want you to know that it means a lot. Now, discussions of writing often focus on technique, the words, sentences, structures, and tropes that are easy to recognize and fun to replicate. I think the most fun to be had with writing is in talking about style, but style alone does not make your writing great. That's a lesson I learned as a student all those years ago, and it's probably a lesson that many writers don't learn right away. A praiseworthy style is good, but only if it's backed up by the right kind of writing. So whether you're a student writing for an assignment or you're writing in order to address a situation in real life, the crucial first step is to make sure that you're responding to the exigence in an appropriate way. If not, nothing else will matter because readers won't recognize your work as the right kind of work for the situation. Once you're writing the right thing, though, then you can have all kinds of fun dressing it up however you want. And of course, we've got so much more writing fun on the way, so we are parting ways for now, but don't go too far because we'll be back together before you know it. <laughs>